everything will work for the TV. And ironically, I got an e email asking us to uh, talk louder and talk into our mics so they can hear us on TV. So I guess that works out pretty good. <laughs> and then uh, with that, I will ask for the roll call. Warren. Here. Berg. Here. Serta. Here. Davis. Excuse. Groff. Here. Hannah. Here. Kittleston. Here. Clayhunas. Here. Manny. Here. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Ryan. Here. Susha. Here. Vanderweel. Here. Rahasla. Here. Fifteen present, one excuse. We have a quorum, and I will call the Committee of the Whole meeting to order. And I will ask for approval of minutes of the last meeting held July 10th, 2006. Second. Motion is second. Is there any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Any opposed? Motion passes. With that, we'll start with the presentation regarding the Sheboygan Pedestrian Bridge. And I will turn, o turn it over to Tom Holton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everybody. Uh, as you all know, we've been talking about pedestrian bridge on the South Pier area for probably three, four, five years, probably, something like that. And uh, uh, we have a couple of gentlemen here that have been working with us on coming up with a concept plan for the bridge. Uh, Mr. Ed Freer from JJR to Madison, they were the planners uh, for the South Pier project, and that will give some background uh, on South Pier and the, some of the reasonings uh, behind the bridge. And we have uh, Miguel Rosales, uh, who's designed the bridge. He's very world-renowned on bridge design. So we're very fortunate to have him working on the project with us. With that, then I'll turn it over to Ed. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having us. Uh, I see a few familiar faces, and I see some new faces. Uh, how many people were involved in the, the original uh, planning effort, if I could see a show of hands. So I don't want to bore you, but I do want to at least bring people up to speed if that's okay. Um, behind me here, we have, uh, actually it's quite an old drawing, and it's, it resembles a lot of what's going on. There are a few things that are different, but in concept, I think it's an appropriate drawing to use to explain a few things. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, after, I don't know how many decades of having fuel tanks out here, and your major um, coal pile was right here, uh, we were hired to, hired to look at a few of the alternatives of how to develop or redevelop the approximate 40 acres. And uh, so there was the issue of what should it be. We came up with a couple of uh, alternatives. We uh, went through a public process, and then the consensus plan pretty much uh, became the foundation for this plan. And what it really is is it's a mixed-use waterfront district. And it's broken up into a couple of sub-areas. And you can see between the uh, fish cleaning station and some of the buildings that are going in along the river, the idea was to emulate the shanties and create kind of a shanty district, rebuild the bulkhead, create a promenade, a riverfront promenade that complements the existing one on the... Uh, upland side of the river, and then take advantage of the navigational channel, maintain maritime activity, honor uh, some of the historic uses, take advantage of the navigational channel and the federal break wall to, at some point in the future, reserve that area for larger commercial uh, vessel traffic, tie it into the marina, which was over here, in terms of launch activity, transient dockage, again, tourism, and, and make it a viable working, maintain it as a viable working, but also recreation and tourism. So the bulkhead was rebuilt. The site was cleaned up. The beach, the sand dunes, there was a restoration plan that restored the, uh, the dunes and started replanting beach grass and, and uh, native vegetation. Then we came up with the middle of it as kind of a mixed use. You could live, work, uh, shop type of activity. So the core of the project is evolving everything from entertainment, as you see some of the buildings going in. But eventually, uh, we're hopeful that housing will go in there. 
Housing has gone in to the side of the, uh, the water park resort, and that was part of uh, its um, condominium type uh, use, and that was part of the economic formula to make the resort happen. So now we've got a destination resort, some investment housing, uh, year-round housing work play, and then a shanty district. We talked a lot about the industrial use. It was decided that it should stay and let the market drive that. So when the time is right, the streets are laid out and the plan can evolve so that this district can then move towards Indiana and fulfill final development of that area. I think an important aspect and one of the, the founding principles throughout the whole planning process was to ensure 24-hour public access. That was critical to the plan and that was reinforced by the public. So the whole perimeter of the peninsula is publicly accessible, whether you want to just go for a walk, a run, come out here early in the morning and fish. There's public parking here. There's public parking on the streets. The streets are laid out in such a way, very comparable to what you see in downtown or some of the neighborhoods. It's all interconnected. There are no dead ends. There are no cul-de-sacs. So in terms of safety and service and uh, enhancing development, the streets were laid out that way. The city then, as part of the plan, put in all the infrastructure, the streets, the lights, the street trees, and the sidewalks. In addition to that, there are a number of public spaces or plazas and promenades that then tie the riverside to the lakeside of the project or allow for different uh, circulation patterns through it. Because of the river and the 8th Street Bridge, we were looking for another opportunity to negotiate the connection to the land side. One of those opportunities is the idea of a water taxi. It's easy to tie it into the marina, and one thought was, well, what if we ferry people over there? That was a consideration. And it can still happen on the short term. But four years ago, one of the big ideas then was to incorporate a pedestrian bridge. As I explained earlier, this is a federal navigation channel that supports a lot of navigational use upriver, uh, especially in terms of sailboats and larger vessels. So this bridge was replaced, what, six years ago? So almost 10 years ago. Wow. How easy we forget. Um, so this has been a, a major upgrade 10 years ago. It was important to honor and maintain that uh, federal navigational channel. So the idea was discussed of this possibly being a movable bridge, not for vehicular use, but for pedestrian use. That does a number of things. First of all, it takes a waterfront district or neighborhood and connects it to the mainland and especially to the downtown. So the downtown, this becomes an extension of the downtown. You could eventually, as this gets built out, you could live here, cross the bridge, and walk to work downtown. From an economic standpoint, it extends the visitation and the experience, whether you're a tourist or you're there for retail activity. <clears throat> it also is a pivotal element in terms of energizing the existing shanty retail on the, on the inland side of the river. So now the retail here and the retail here start acting as a sub-district, and the bridge is a key element. So I've got cultural ties, residential ties, work-live ties, and business ties. The other thing it does is it ties this activity, this destination activity, as I said earlier, to the investment in the marina. Whether I go by launch, water taxi, or I'm a transient boater, I come to Sheboygan, I'm traveling with a bicycle, I get on the bicycle, I go through the neighborhood, past the armory, along the river walk, across the bridge, now I'm down at South Pier. What it also does for the general public, uh, in terms of a, a resident perspective, it now ties the beach, the fishing, to the mainland. It also ties the South Beach, which is down here, to the North Beach. So it connects one beach to the other beach, it also becomes a destination from a county perspective. You can go from this beach or the South Beach, cross the bridge, which aligns with Virginia, 
which is a dedicated bike route. And you can, you can start here as a visitor or a resident and go all the way west of Kohler to the western end of the, of the state to the, um, it's called the Plank, Plank Road Trail. And I'm not sure if it's connected all the way to Fond du Lac, but it's pretty darn close. So you can actually take a bike from Fond du Lac to Lake Michigan, and this bridge then completes the final gap. So you can see a number of reasons for how the plan evolved and what an integral part this bridge has been from the early conception of the master plan. Um, these bulkheads, these plazas, they were all designed and planned in anticipation for that missing link and key. So as we got to a point here, um, Miguel and his, his former partner, Fred uh, Gottemiller, we've, uh, the two firms have collaborated prior. And then we, we kept talking about this, and Miguel would call me up and say, is it ready for the bridge? <laughs> and I would say, not yet, not yet. So as the project evolved, uh, the infrastructure was put in place, it was time to call in Miguel. So Miguel put a project uh, proposal together to look at a couple of alternatives, look at different technology, and then assess what it might cost. And so I'm not going to steal his thunder. Miguel will now walk us through the design process and some of his experience and background, which hopefully will hopefully explain how we went from this, this uh, magic marker drawing and concept plan to this wonderfully crafted model. And I could tell you a lot about that, but I don't want to uh, steal his thunder. He's going to do a wonderful job explaining it. Is there anything I need to clarify or that I missed? Is there, is, it, is there any questions from the alderman? Yeah. Alderman Hanna? Yes. Uh, do we have a projected uh, incremental economic impact of a pedestrian bridge being added? Uh, when we've done this in other areas, what has been the result? I don't have exact numbers, and we haven't been engaged to do a study, but I would uh, wager that there's, there's a number of reasons it, it's more plus than negative. Uh, and I think if you go down to Milwaukee, there's a perfect example, the, the new Calatrava addition to the, to the museum. It not only attracts tourists from, from Wisconsin, it attracts tourists from the region as well as other parts of the world. So it becomes a tourist destination from the other parts of the world. Uh, and the country. The other thing it does is it, uh, you have economic benefit f for the reasons I just explained. Mm -hmm. With a pedestrian bridge here, it reduces the risk for a retailer or a development investment on, on the district, in the, on, the, uh, on the peninsula. So there's an economic gain there where it, it makes it more developer friendly, reducing the risk. And uh, for those of you that have lived here I don't live here, but I've been visiting here for probably close to 20 years. Uh, there has been some turnover in the businesses here. By creating more of a critical mass, it will reduce the turnover and it will increase, um, I'll use a, a kind of a suburban retail term, cluster retailing or that cluster appeal. There's a cluster of restaurants, a cluster of shops. So by increasing that critical mass, you elevate the, the, uh, the attractiveness as a destination, and you reduce the economic um, risk in terms of success. Paulette, has, is there anything from the planning and economics that might support some of that? There haven't been any studies, correct? Yeah. Alderman Reckey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question really is in regards to the 9th District Coast Guard in Cleveland, Ohio. What type of regulations do we have to uh, or hurdles do we have to clear blocking a navigational waterway? Um, what type of permits and things are required? I mean, it's, that's a big hurdle in this particular, uh, it, it's, in this matter. It's, it's no different than the 8th Street Bridge. But the 8th Street Bridge has been existing there for the last 100 or so years. But, this is a brand new hurdle going into the river. Right. What type of uh, regulations are in place for such you, a thing? You've got all your permitting and regulations. You have to talk to the Coast Guard, the Corps, the DNR, all those folks. It, it's, it's not a carte blanche. That, that's, I want to be perfectly clear on that. However, um, this current design without, again, this is a concept. All of what you speak of is part of the actual next level of design. So we're not there yet. That's why I want to get this approved and go to the next phase. The conceptual design, and again, I'll let Miguel address some of this, 
does not compromise navigation ability or the, uh, the river channel. It honors the federal channel. It does not compromise that. And it would have to honor that. No other questions? Then we will continue. Miguel? Sir, if, if you could just speak in the mic so the TV can hear, since we're waiting. Thank you. One, one of the thoughts here is that we think of it in reverse. A vehicular bridge, we like to maintain the vehicular access because of business and emergency, and then we open it up to accommodate the navigational traffic. The thought here is that the bridge would be open and then close on 20-minute or 30-minute intervals during high season. So it'd be kind of a, a reverse thinking, so that the priority is given to the waterway, and then the secondary uh, operational mode is given to the pedestrian. So if I'm going to have lunch down there, working downtown, I know the bridge will be closed at 12 o'clock. I make sure I'm there at 5 or 12, walk across, meet my friends for lunch. So it's that kind of a, a thought pattern going. Was, um, there was a pedestrian bridge proposed there. And it's a very small pedestrian bridge. It's about, um, uh, I think, like 260 feet wide, long. And um, the bridge cost $4.5 million. That was the cost of the construction of the bridge. But um, recently I was there, and the mayor told me they have had approximately $125 million now development. And that's because they have started to build many buildings you know, around the bridge trying to look at the structure. Um, so they have more than pay off, you know, the investment on the bridge. And, and I'm going to show you one of those. One, I want to show you that bridge here. Um, my experience basically is in the design of bridges. I only work on bridges, and we have a national firm. And um, we have been involved in many landmark bridges across the U.S. And I'm just going to show you some examples so you can get an idea of the type of work that we do. Um, the first bridge that I started working about... Um, almost 20 years ago, is the Sakin Bridge in Boston. Uh, this bridge is, uh, is a new cable state bridge, and is located very close to the downtown. Um, it's a new gateway into the city. Um, there used to be an existing bridge that uh, you can see here. Here. And it was a very unattractive truss bridge. And the city wanted to change that. They wanted to have a new interstate bridge that would have more of a presence going into the city. Um, so the new design was developed about 10 years ago, and uh, it's, it's been recently completed. Um, it's a very wide bridge. It's, a, it's 10 lanes. Of course, you know, it's a very, it's the interstate bridge. But there was a lot of concern in terms of how to make it aesthetic, how to, how to make it attractive. Um, and it's a very interesting bridge because it has a, a special kind of cable arrangement that makes it quite unique. Uh, this is on BOC, um, you know, from one side, and, uh, and at night it's also illuminated. 
And I have to tell you that once the bridge was completed, um, it really changed the whole image of the whole area. And uh, it has created new parks, new development. There is new buildings going across. So it really changed that whole area. And, um, and there was a lot of concern because it's a very modern bridge, and Boston is very traditional. And they were afraid of doing something so modern. But now everybody is very happy with the design. Um, this is another bridge I worked um, some years back. This is in Panama. It's over the Panama Canal. And here the government wanted to make a very large bridge because the canal is expanding. And right now they have very big boats that they want to come into the canal, and the clearance is not big enough. Um, so it's a cable state bridge, but it's also very light. It's a very light structure um, that was built very quickly. And it's a concrete structure um, that has a tower just in the middle with a single plane of cables in the middle. And it you know, tries to mimic like a sailboat, something very marine. Um, there's some other views of the, of the bridge. Of course, they are very proud of the structure, and you know, it really is a source of national pride now in the country. Um, this is a smaller bridge. This one is um, it's in Des Moines, Iowa. And here, the city had always had um, arch bridges over the Des Moines River. But they never had a bridge that had an arch going over the highway, and uh, they never had that kind of presence. And um, we proposed this bridge for them, and it's very much aligned with, um, with their highest tower. And they wanted to have this kind of frame, you know, going into the city. Um, and um, it also was built recently. It's, it's also illuminated at night. It's a very simple structure, but it has a lot of thought in terms of the detailing. And this is another view of it. Together with this bridge, the city also decided to do three pedestrian bridges. And we, we continue to kind of follow that same theme, you know, of the blue arches. And uh, these are some of the pedestrian bridges that, that have been built after the main, the, the main bridge was proposed. Um, this bridge is interesting because usually what happens is that you have a big cage here and, uh, because it's going over the interstate, I-235. And we propose this fence here that is curved and it's very high on this point and it's low here. So it actually gives you the safety, but at the same time doesn't interrupt the aesthetics you know, of the design. There's some views of it. And it connects two different schools. And before, um, you know, the crossing was kind of uh, very unattractive and people were not using it. Now it's really a destination and a lot of people are using the bridge crossing from one side to the other. Um, this is another, another project. This one is in um, Washington, D.C. It's a very large bridge um, where we work in the competition concept. Um, this bridge is, um, is 12 lanes wide, <laughs> but it's supposed to look very light and that's why we have this kind of B-shaped piers um, that um, kind of follow the tradition of having arches, but they are not really arches. It's like a new interpretation of an arch. There is a lot of arch bridges in Washington, D.C., but we wanted to do something that will relate to the arches but have kind of a different appearance. And one of the things that is um, interesting about it is that, is that the way it opens. It's, um, it's a bascule structure simil similar to the one that you have here, but the bascule is, is open and is um, kind of hidden. So when it's closed, there is the flow of the structure is not interrupted. So you continue to have, you know, the same kind of appearance. So it doesn't have that big break, you know, with the, with the bascule span. And this is the construction of it. Um, it's almost um, finished. One of them has been finished, one side, and the second part will be finished in 2008. And uh, the last project example is this project in Greenville, South Carolina. It's the project I was mentioning to you. It's a $4.5 million, and now has created a lot of new development in the area. Um, it's a bridge that is located in a park, and uh, it has a, a waterfall next to it that is here. And the waterfall was hidden for like many, many years in the 1960s because they have a highway going over the waterfall. And the mayor decided to change that and demolish the highway and put a new pedestrian bridge. And we thought that the pedestrian bridge should be curved away from the waterfall. So when you are standing here, you can look at the water, and it really creates like a promenade, you know, looking into the area. And it's incredible how the whole area is changing so much. There is so many more buildings along Main Street that is located here because of, you know, the way the park and the bridge are working together. It's a, it's a very light structure. It's a, it's a suspension bridge, but it's unique because it's only suspended from one side. Uh, you know, usually you have cables on both sides, but this one only has one cable on one side. And it's away from the waterfall. So when you are standing in the bridge and looking out, then you have this kind of theater, you know, in the back, you know, with the cables. 
And this is another view of it. And you can see how you know, it's integrated into the waterfall. And I always feel like it's um, very important to make them very light and very transparent. So, so you can see the trees through, and it doesn't really block your view. And uh, we did this type of uh, railings and details that allow it to be you know, quite light. And it also it's illuminated at night. And uh, one of the main features is that the surface where the people walk has this light blue color. And, um, and this light is hidden in the railing. So you never see the light, only when it comes at night. And it's very dramatic. It's, it becomes the, kind of the most romantic area now you know, for people to walk at night. All the couples go and uh, walk next to the, next to the waterfall. And um, now I want to show you um, the project that I have proposed here for, for Sheboygan. Um, it's, um, it's an interesting site because you have um, two kind of uh, axes going in different directions. You have this big promenade that goes to the water and goes to the beaches here in one direction, and then you have this street going in the other direction. And um, it, it was not possible to just make a bridge that goes just completely straight because you have these two existing grids that connect. And, um, and it's a very flat area. Um, you have very low buildings that, that allow so to do like an interesting bridge that if it's high, you should be able to see it from a long distance. And that will be of interest because then people will kind of mark the area and have like a new image for that area. And one of the challenges here is that um, you basically have about 220 feet here of span. And the navigation channel you know, for the Coast Guard should be about 150 feet or so. So that means that the bridge should be very much open. Somehow there should be a structure that allows to have, you know, that big span. And, um, you know, these are basically the, the constraints that you have. You have the navigation channel that you will need to get a permit from the Coast Guard, you know, because it's a navigable water. Uh, you have these two access points, the two red dots, that I think should not be changed. You know, at one point we thought about maybe just putting the bridge straight. But I think it's very interesting that this bridge ends you know, at the end of this street. And this is actually in a hill. So if you are here, you should be able to see the entrance of the bridge. And also in this area, you have a big axis here. So it was also interesting to have, you know, that some kind of point there at the end. Then you have the clearance envelope. Of course, you have very, you know, sailboats and, you know, that I will have a very clear uh, area that needs to be preserved. So we thought about a bascule bridge or a swing bridge, something that would allow it to be clear. Uh, the cost and the construction schedule, we feel like um, this bridge will, could be completed in about two and a half years, including the final design. And the total cost will be about five, $5 million. Um, and we will not take any of the existing buildings. Uh, if everything that is in the fabric there will be preserved, trying to integrate it as much as possible. And you can see here one of the axis points you know, for the bridge on one side and then from the other side. And, um, and we study, you know, different shapes of how to make the crossing. And um, finally, we came with this um, S shape for the crossing. And what it allows you to do is like to navigate the two axes and make something very smooth between the connection of the two. And also, when you are walking on a curb, it's always softer and it's always nicer for people in a bicycle or in a pedestrian to have a curb because, you know, that's how the people walk. And we said that if you make it a, a straight line, it will be like very abrupt because you will just do very quickly make a connection just like that. With the curve, it makes it much more smooth, especially if you are, you know, with a baby carriage or you are walking, you know, slowly. And uh, this is the, you know, the proposal for the new alignment. Um, you could have done a bascule bridge, you know, like the bridge that you have right now that it basically opens up, but it's 220 feet wide. So if you make uh, two bascules, you know, it will be very big to open 100 feet. Now your navigation channel is very small where the existing bridge is. Um, and this one will need to be much bigger. So I thought a, a swing bridge would be better for this location, something that will swing and will open. And this is, you know, what you have here. One, um, one thing that is um, important is that you have already this control tower here in this location. And although you cannot see the bridge, particularly from this location, this controller could also control the other one, you know, with the installation of some cameras that will announce that, you know, you have people coming in a boat. And usually that you could also coordinate it, that if one bridge opens, the other one will open at the same time. So, you know, you have, you know, that coordination, and you already have this facility that could be incorporated into the other one. So that's, 
That's something that is already existing there. Um, and this is the proposal uh, for the bridge. Uh, it's a cable structure, and it has two main towers that are 50 feet high. And they are marking in the axis of the both locations. So if you are either in this direction or in this direction, you should be able to see the tower from a distance. And then uh, you have these three cables that are stable, that stabilize the tower. So the tower is kind of rigid. And there, is, there has a rotation here at the top. So it's kind of like something that rotates at the top, like kind of like, a, like um, one thing inside the other one. And then, you know, these cables here move with this location, and then they will open in one direction or open in the other direction. And um, I would like to show you afterwards the model, and we can operate, and you can see, you know, how it opens. Let's see. Um, this is the view from above. The, the yellow lines are, is the, where the navigation channel is supposed to be allowed you know, for boats uh, in the river. And this is how it's closed and open. Uh, you leave about 150 feet of opening. That is more than is required. What is required right now is only 130 feet minimum requirement for the, for the navigation channel. And um, this is just marking more or less you know, the, the, the height of the tower. And I think it's, it will be a little higher than the buildings existing, but it's not too high. It's not too oppressive. I think it will blend very well, you know, with the area. And this is the view from the other direction. Uh, and this is a, a photography you're looking at from the air. And this is when it opens. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, when I show it to people in, other, uh, in Boston and other places, they actually like it very much open. So, so it might be possible to leave it open most of the day and then just close it at certain times. So you are not really interrupting the navigation and you don't have to be opening and closing it. So maybe, you know, you can open it early in the morning at noon when there is people walking and having lunch and then in the afternoon, you know, when people are, are waking. And then again, you could also leave it closed in the weekend and you could coordinate that. It gives you a lot of possibilities. The other thing that you can do is that um, you can decide to... Um, only open one side and leave the other one closed. So you don't need to operate the whole system constantly because opening only one side will allow you also to have some boats crossing. So I think it has a lot of you know, flexibility in that sense. Um, this is a cross-section of, of the bridge. Um, the bridge um, we propose is to be 12 feet wide. 12 feet wide is kind of a generous you know, distance that would allow to have traffic going in both directions without interruption. And you could have also two bicycles, one in each direction. Um, it has to be, the railing has to be about four feet high, you know, for any safety. If somebody is on a bicycle, it needs to be of a certain height. But it can, as I showed you in the bridge in Greenville, it can be very transparent, doesn't need to be obstructive. I only have allowed 2.3 uh, feet, 2 feet 3 inches for the depth. And the reason for having a very light structure is because... Um, it might be possible that some small boats might still go underneath. You know, you have something that doesn't have a mast. And so it's important to keep it as thin as possible because it might allow to have some boats going underneath. And the bridge will have a, a um, gentle slope of about 5%. So at the, at the center of the navigation channel will be higher and then will be lower when you get to the, you know, to the land. And um, one other possibility here is that we could have um, the... Um, this surface here could be made out of wood. Um, and that's one possibility that we could explore, you know, like a very hard wood that would not require a lot of maintenance. But it will tie it together with the other wood that you have in the other path, you know, with the shanty towns and the architecture. And that will make it, you know, very, it's very nice to walk on the wood. It, it's kind of romantic. Um, so that's, you know, one, of a, one, one possibility to do that. Um, this is some view, you know, when you are coming from the, from the beach and then going into town. Sorry, let me just go back. And um, one thing that is interesting about this is like, once you are in the bridge, your view will always change. So, you know, because you enter in this S curve, you'll be changing views and will be very um, dynamic. It will not be like a static because you will be going, you know, kind of moving around the structure. So these are like different views once you are inside the bridge. And uh, this is a view of the model opening. 
actually say photography of, you know, of this model here, how it opens. Um, somebody told me it kind of looks like a wing, you know, like you have like a wing opening in one direction and then opening in the other direction. And this is the bridge opening. And, um, and I think the architecture of the bridge ties very well to what exists there because it reminds me very much of a boat, you know, like a sailboat with the white, you know, towers. So it's very much integrated to that location. It will kind of maintain that character that you have read right now there. And, um, and of course, you could illuminate it at night also. You could have, you know, something like that, where, again, the surface, you know, where people are walking could be illuminated, and you could have a color, and you could also play, you know, with the top of the towers here. You could have kind of like a beacon here at the very top that will, you'll see from a distance and will mark, you know, where is that location. This is another view of the structure. It's a, it's a very light structure. I feel it's, um, it's very original. Like nobody else has proposed anything similar anywhere else in the US or actually anywhere else. So you will have a special structure for your town that nobody else will have. And I think people always like that because you know, then you, you can have like a sense of pride you know, that you have something special for your location. Um, and I feel the investment of five million compared to what investment you could get around the area is, is kind of a minimum investment. And you could get so much more, you know, with new development and attract new people. And actually, the whole river, I think, will change with such a bridge. It will really attract, you know, an all, a lot of new people coming into the city. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. And if you would like to ask me any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the mechanical part of the structure, what kind of a warranty is on that, on the mechanical part of the bridge, or what is the warranty in general? Um, I would say that, you know, the bridge needs to be inspected like every two, two to three years. Um, but um, if it's uh, maintained and inspected, it's, it's unlimited. It should be like last about 100 years, I would say. Um, you know, they will, we will use uh, uh, <clears throat> the best equipment at the beginning, so you don't need to have, you know, a lot of maintenance. Uh, but it will need to be inspected about two to th every two to three years. But but the but the the company that's making the bridge, yes, is it warranted to be defect free for five years or ten years or one year? What 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 is our when how long of a time don't we have to worry about any exposure as far as maintenance? Um, I would say that um, they should warrant the the mechanical equipment should be warranted between thirty and forty years. You should, be able, you should not have any problems, you know, in that range. But that, uh, that's a written warranty. Yeah, you should, yeah. Okay. Should, yes. All right. It's time yes. to get the job. Yes. It's time to get the job. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just to give you an idea, the bridge, that was, the, the bridge that was replaced on 8th Street, that was opened in 1935, and it was replaced 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, once you do a structure, like a new structure with a high technology, it should last 100 years. I mean, you know, and these cables are stainless steel, so they're very durable. We try to do, you know, the best quality material so you don't have to be constantly be maintaining them. Alderman Graf, you had a question? Yes. Um, what happens to this bridge um, during our winters? Um, you, could, you could still open it. I mean, I think what it will be important to do is, um, for example, if you use slats, you know, the, the water will go through you know, to the, to the river. Uh, you don't need to have like a special um, drainage system. Um, I don't know how many people are going to be walking in the winter time. So, you know, to save operation of the bridge, you might want to close it, you know, the worst months, you know, like February and I don't know. I don't know how many months you have that are very bad. But um, it should be able to be, to be operable. Uh, and also, once the winter comes, I'm sure your boats don't come very often either. Uh, so it could stay fixed, you know, for a certain number of times. But I think the, the design has a lot of flexibility. So you could, like, make a schedule for the whole year and decide when you want to have it open, when you, had, when you want to have it closed. If we, if we will go with this concept, I'm guessing it would be closed three to four months out of the year. Alderman Ryan, you had a question? The, the mechanical end of this, is that uh, uh, electric motor open gear? Is that hydraulic? Operation? Yes. Yes, it's an electric system. Electric. Yes, Open yes, gear. yes. 
it's like a you know rotation at the top right. of the tower. Um, Rotating shaft on a disc. Right. It's a good way to envision it. And once you see it, I think you'll understand why. Yes, it's not um, it's not obvious at the beginning because you know some of the cables stay fixed and some of the cables move with the structure. Um, but if you see it in the model, you'll understand it better. President Berg, you had a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your close clearance to water line is eight feet. I believe the A Street Bridge is likely something like 15 or 16. Standard Express Cruiser, which has an 11 foot clearance generally to the radar arch, uh, the development plan had our charter fishing fleet uh, be on the other side of the bridge. I would guess our charter fishing fleet requires a height of something like uh, 14 to 17 feet uh, because most of those have uh, our sedan bridge types of cruisers. Uh, and they will be going out at different times during the day. So in terms of the boating activity, you will have a significant amount of activity uh, that will be going through that part of the bridge. Yes. And I guess, is there, uh, have you given that any consideration? We've, yes, we have. We've had some discussion. We probably do is keep the bridge in an open position most of the time and close it, whether it's once every half or once an hour for pedestrians to use it. Otherwise, it would remain open for the traf boat traffic. Because I could walk around there, and I, maybe I'm a contrarian, but if the bridge is open, I could walk around that whole area in 10 minutes. But I could see people gathering, waiting for that bridge to close and to go across it, and maybe it's once every 20 minutes. The A Street Bridge is pretty much on schedule once every 20 minutes. You can coordinate it with that, too. And again, we like to encourage you to think the reverse. Usually we think of a bridge as closed and having to open for navigation. In this case, the concept is to leave the bridge open and close it to enhance pedestrian navigation of the river, which is now not possible. So you're enhancing something that doesn't exist, and you're putting a minimal compromise on the water navigation. For $5 million. <laughs> well, but, but the issue here is that, you know, again, you said I can walk around there because you're very familiar with, with the, uh, the situation. And back to an earlier question, as I was sitting there listening to uh, Miguel, I was thinking of cities around the world where bridges are key to serve the pedestrian and, and bring two sides of the river together. And I realize there are cities in other parts of the world, and they are bigger cities. But if you do go to London right now, there's been four or five brand new pedestrian bridges to facilitate pedestrian uh, uh, circulation. You look uh, in some of the older cities, there are these incredible pedestrian bridges, multiple decks. Uh, go to Toronto right now. Toronto is reinventing itself with bridges across these old keys and, and piers, and it's all redevelopment. I'm working on a project now that's, that will have a pedestrian bridge in Cleveland that will tie the museums together and offer 2,000 new homes on the waterfront once the pier relocates to the other side of the river. Let's, let's go to Wisconsin now. Uh, we're designing a bridge that's going to connect the island to the new museum on the waterfront, on the lakefront, that will allow for 24-hour fishing access of the area around Summerfest. Again, accommodating how many millions of people that go down there along Milwaukee. That bridge is not as complicated as this. It's over a million dollars, okay? Uh, I worked in uh, Racine, and we redid the Main Street Bridge there to widen it on top as well as accommodating pedestrian circulation on the two edges. Uh, the investment in Racine was to the tune of somewhere between 23 and 25 million. It has experienced over a $250 million return. Okay, uh, we're, let's talk about this project right here. You're saying $5 million. We haven't done an economic study. I'm not sure what the economic positive impact is going to be on your downtown. I don't know what the economic impact is going to be on the island because the study, ha the peninsula, because the study hasn't been done. I do know that the bridge, right now you've got over 150 of investment on the peninsula. This bridge will help reduce the risk and encourage the other 100 million that's possible here right now today. Those are big numbers of returns. Alderman Kittleson? 
Thank you. Um, you said the bridge will cost $5 million? Yes. 5.2? And then you said something about five years? Was Two and a half years. How many? Two and a half years. Two and a half years to, yes. build, to build the bridge. Yes, also including the design. And the 5.2 million also includes all the construction drawings and the construction supervision. It's the whole package. Uh, I think the, if it was only the construction cost of the bridge is about 4.6 million, but you need to add, you know, you know, all the construction drawing, the final design, and the construction supervision. Thank you. I mean, you know, one thing that is good about the pedestrian bridge is that it's very small, so you can build it very quickly. And uh, you can get a lot of benefit very fast, <laughs> you know, like, like the other bridges I show you, like, for example, the one in Boston that took like 15 years. Because when you do a highway bridge, it's so many, much more paperwork and, you know, so many more permits. But with a pedestrian bridge, you can make a, you know, relatively small investment and get a very big return. And that's why I experienced in Greenville. You know, again, it cost 4.5 million, and now the whole city is changed. I mean, even so much that the the mayor decided to put the bridge in their logo now, you know, so the city has the, the picture of the bridge. Um, and um, you can uh, re really, I think that sometimes people uh, can underestimate the power of a structure like this, but it's something that can really turn people's imagination, and, uh, and it can really transform an area, more than a building. Like, that's I think, my experience. You know, when you do a nice bridge, like something that is interesting and unique, it has a lot more power than a building, because it's more public, and people can relate to it very much, it becomes really part of the community. It's like a, you know, it becomes a community icon, something that people can relate and they can use all the time, and you know, it's, um, it really regenerates the area very much. Thank you. Alderman Manny, you had a question? Yeah, thank you. I'm wondering about night navigational guidelines and how they would impact this bridge. I don't know how they impact the 8th Street Bridge either. All, all of your navigational all of your navigational aids and guidelines would have to be, uh, you'd have to be in full compliance. Can you summarize those for us real quickly? The lighting, the signage, and the uh, decals, they, they would all be incorporated. The green, you know, the right return, the green, it, it all has to comply. All of your regulation, core, and Coast Guard uh, navigational aids. Yeah, I mean, one, one good thing about the site is that you already have one mobile bridge very close. So you already have that experience. So the Coast Guard you know, we'll have a, a, a history of how it operated and what is the best operation, and we will just apply, you know, the same system. Um, you have to have night lights, you know, they usually will be like, they probably be integrated, you know, in, the, in this side of the structure, you know, at this level, um, so they know that, uh, you know, where the navigation channel is and, you know, if it has to be open. But um, if you illuminate the towers and the cables, it will be b visible from a very long distance, so you know, the navigation uh, lights would just be a complement to the overall view of the structure. Yeah, this, this would have to be reviewed and signed off by all the uh, permitting folks. Yeah, you, could, you need to get the, a, a, um, the bridge permit because it's a navigable water. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that we will do is, like, if this proceeds to the final design, the first, one of the first activities is to show it to the Coast Guard and see if they have any, you know, any issues or concerns. I mean, we, I think comfortable that we have complied with, you know, the navigation requirements and the depth, you know, and because it opens completely, you don't have any clearance problems. You know, any size uh, sailboat can come through. So that's an advantage. Uh, sometimes when you have a bascule bridge, you know, depending on where the leaf opens, it might create some kind of obstruction. But in this case, it's open, completely open. Um, so we would just like to see, you know, what kind of during operations, what kind of requirements they have. But I'm pretty comfortable the, the navigation span and the clearance is what they care more about. Um, because they don't want to create another obstacle, obviously. You know, they protect the water of the United States. So they want to have it as open as, as possible. The, the other, the other um, issue is the width of the bridge. Uh, Miguel uh, quoted a 12-foot dimension. That also meets the AASHTO standards in terms of the bike path regulations and things like that. So again, enabling you to uh, pursue funding that relates to those types of transportation uh, enhancements. We have quite a few questions yet. Alderman Ryan. Um, right now in, in the city, you know, you, you're probably uh, detecting a little, uh, a little negativity toward the project uh, because the city's basically right now and not in a, a good cash position to, uh, to take on anything like this. Uh, I think if we set that aside 
if, if we set the money aside and look at it conceptually, I think it's a great idea for the city. Um, with the riverfront right now, and I, and I do spend some time down there getting coffee and this and that, uh, you always see a lot of people that are on the shanty side of the, of the, of the river right now. Um, and being local Sheboyganites, most of us, uh, we kind of live in a small world. And to have to actually get in your car and drive around the other side or to walk that far, we don't do it. I think this bridge would be a great asset as far as tying it together. I think the economic impact will be, will be uh, uh, significant in the long run. Uh, but right now, you know, uh, we're not in a good cash position in this city, and uh, hopefully there can be some uh, private funding uh, that may become available to help us out with this project. Well, and we understand that, and our first stop will be at the county for that non-motorized transportation money. That's where we'll go for first uh, to try to uh, get some money out of there. We realize that the city can't afford $5 million for a pedestrian bridge, and and Ed had mentioned enhancement monies, too, There's, uh, for bike and pedestrian ways there also. So we have a few options, and we need to start going in that direction. But the first stop will be at the county. What, what type of money are we talking from the county on the? The, the process isn't in place yet. We just started meeting. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be requiring any kind of a match. Don't know yet. Can't answer that question yet. And, Tom, you're on the, uh, the committee? Yes, I am. There's 30 members of that committee, and I'm one of the members on there. Total available there is. It's 25 million over the next f four years, uh, with some of that's going towards administration. So I'm thinking there's probably, uh, I've heard different numbers, but maybe optimistically four million a year for projects. This is federal money. Federal money. Yep. Cheboygan County is one of f uh, four different areas that received this money in the country. So if we look at this and say there may be some funding out there for it, it looks like a heck of a lot better idea. Well, I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, it wasn't that long ago that you were looking at building a marina. Right. And the city wasn't that much better off back then. And the marina happened because of a pooling of resources, public-private partnerships, some donorship, everything from individual pavers and benches and trees to some uh, corporate donations for the yard arm and the plaza. Uh, every project I've worked on, would not be possible without that kind of a partnering. So I guess uh, Miguel and I especially are kind of pleading here that if the idea is right and the concept is right, we're asking that you support it with the understanding you have to figure out how to finance it. Right. Uh, every project that I've worked on for the last 30 years, uh, I've promised to minimize the impact on the local taxpayer, and that can be done here as well. Um, Again, if you can get public sources that aren't on the local tax books, you can make it happen and balance that with some private donations. Again, uh, 18, 19 million, the new island and the, uh, and the uh, bridge right in front of Milwaukee, that's all coming from state and federal funds, including the Corps of Engineers. Uh, Racine, most of that money was state, county, and uh, federal. Huge, huge amounts are, are, are broken down that way. Um, I forget, your, your single leaf 8th Street bridge cost $8.5 million, just to give you an idea, and that was, what, an 80, 100-foot, 75-foot uh, leaf, okay? And considerably more complicated high, uh, mechanism. Than, I mean, this, this is sophisticated. is a sophisticated design that makes it look less complicated. It is complicated, but a different kind of complexity. Right. <laughs> No, you know, I, I think the, the bridge is, is going to be a great asset. And, uh, and it, 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 you're right. I mean, I think the economic impact and uh, just the, the image improvement of the entire, uh, entire area, I think it'll be a great asset. Yeah. But, uh, you know, locally, I think there's not a lot of people that are going to, you know, want to uh, uh, use any and use much local funding in order to pay for it. Let, let me just finish my plea here. If you're going to go after any kind of public monies and there isn't public support for the project, you're not right. going to get public money. Right. It's that simple. Oh, so, I, I, I think there's, I mean, people should support this. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, I think it's a necessity in order to, to develop the entire area. Um, 
Well, we have a concept, and if someone likes the concept, they can feel free to give us the money. I think it was two years ago when uh, Mr. Holton asked us for the money to do this study, and he said, we've got to have the concept, and then we'll find the funding. And that's where we are today. Um, Alderman Racky, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, the marina is a bad analogy to bring up. That thing's still costing us off our property tax dollars every year. Um, Secondly, the 8th Street Bridge cost about $8.5 million, and that was a fight that took a few years to get that thing. The marina was put ahead of the 8th Street Bridge, by the way. The city had a history of taking the infrastructure and putting it behind, you know, frivolities such as this bridge. Then the city's got another history of shutting things off when it can't afford to run these things. What is the cost of running this thing going to be on a yearly basis? The cost of the 8th Street Bridge, if I recall correctly from back... Uh, when a new bridge was open, went from $1,200 a year for electricity in the old bridge to $12,000 a year on the new bridge, 10 times the cost of the old bridge. However, the old bridge is ready to fall into the river and couldn't be locked in place anymore, if I recall correctly. But, again, the cost of running this bridge went up considerably over the old bridge. What are we talking about for costs here? What are we talking about for maintenance here? We have wintertime activities down in the riverfront. Just because a lot of the, the sport fishing boats are out of the water, the commercial fish tugs are still in the water going in and out of this marina, or out of this harbor on a regular basis. We need to address that issue. And a bridge that's going to be open most of the time instead of closed, in this city, boy, that'd be the first thing you're going to start squawking about. You built the bridge, it's open, not closed. So, Well, it is a movable bridge. Its intention is to open and close. It's right. Not, it's not a static bridge. But what about maintenance costs and things? What's going to cost us to run such a thing in a year's time? I mean, oh, the city's got a history of running out of money and shutting, you know, the bridge will just sit there open like we had a water feature sitting here, turned off for a couple of years because we couldn't afford to run it. Next thing will be we've got to cut this out of the budget because we can't afford to run it. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, it's a very light structure, so the cost is much less than what you have in the big, in the big structure because the big structure has to be for cars, so the, the, the loads and everything that you have in that very big bridge is going to be substantially more. So I don't know the exact number, you know, but it's going to be much less than what you do, you know, with the main bridge. And the other thing that um, I have experienced in the past is that if you build a very nice structure that people like very much, you get funding to maintain it because it becomes part of your community and you would not let it go, you know, to be destroyed. That has always been my experience. Um, in terms of, um, you know, trying some funding, I would advise you that uh, you could even maybe sell the names, you know, the name rights for the bridge. Uh, in the, the Liberty Bridge that I show you, um, the Liberty Corporation gave $500,000, dollars, you know, to put their name on the structure. But they did that because they think the structure is very attractive, and they think the structure, you know, it has won many awards it's in all the magazines. So people try to be related to something that is successful. And if you were going to build a very like. Um, uh, kind of very, you know, unattractive or, or something not very special, nobody will want to put their name attached to it. So it needs to have, a, you know, that kind of correlation. I know that it's, a, it's an investment and you need to maintain it, but I can assure you it's going to change your city completely. I mean, it's going to create such a uh, kind of new image that um, you, once, you, once you, a few years after it's built, you will have forgotten any problems that you had. Uh, because that's what happens. The bridge really has that power. And I just wanted to say I think that's a good question when you talk about maintenance. And we've had that question. We've talked about what the maintenance cost would be. And this is the beginning stage, and I do feel that it's very critical that we look at maintenance and we look at a possible endowment or how will we maintain this bridge in the future so that it stays operational. You know, and it is, we have traffic all year long. We're unlike a lot of communities that in the winter they shut down. We still have commercial fishermen that come in and out of the river. So, I mean, it's critical that that bridge will, you know, be maintained and will open and close. And it's also critical, I think, that we work on that, that retail mass for both sides so that we're creating not just one district, but a whole entire district of downtown, the riverfront, and South Pier. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to reiterate some of the comments that were said here tonight in regards to um, the feasibility of this. It's, it's a beautiful bridge. There's no doubt about it. And if we had a lot of money, this would be a wonderful concept. 
Um, the only way I would support moving ahead with this project is if somebody funded it completely where it didn't cost anyone in the city a nickel and if there was a mechanism in place where it wouldn't cost anyone in the city a nickel to keep it up for the maintenance. Um, you know, talking about the marina, that's a terrible analogy. The citizens of Sheboygan are still upset that we're losing a quarter of a million dollars a year. They're not allowed to use a swimming pool. People are still angry about that. We were told that when you build the marina, that will make tourism take off. We were told that when you develop the South Pier, it's going to just take off. Well, I, I think that this past spring when we had a referendum about bringing a casino to Sheboygan, it was voted down. And I, I didn't really care about that. But what it said to me was that the citizens of Sheboygan do not want Sheboygan to become a year-round tourist destination. They do not want that. Because if they did, you could go down to the riverfront now, and the shops would be open past 6 PM. The restaurants would be open longer. And you could say, well, you need to have this bridge to get the tourists over there so then they could be open. Um, on Sunday, yesterday, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, my husband and I had the opportunity to go to get something to eat. We went to nine restaurants at 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. They were all closed. So you know, talking about building a bridge to create an economic base for development, we don't necessarily need that in Sheboygan. We have the lake. We have the river. We have the development going in because of the water. They're not going to develop because of the bridge. They're going to develop because of the water. Um, as far as uh, the recreational trail money, I would rather see that money spent on fixing the Eisner Avenue project, things that are going to benefit the citizens that actually live here. Um, I mean, if we could use that money to put in a new storm sewer system at Fifth and New York, that would be absolutely wonderful, but that's probably a stretch of the money. But just to put it in perspective for what's, what's going on with my family, when I take my kids to a park, to Cole Park, which is the closest park to my house, there is an outhouse, literally a porta potty that they have to use. And it's wonderful if you have a three-year-old and they need to use the facilities. I'm very grateful to have that porta potty there. But you're going to tell me that we're supposed to use $5 million to put a bridge up, and yet my children, and we pay a lot of property taxes in the city, have to go in a porta potty in a park because we can't afford to put a flush toilet in that park. There's something wrong with the system. We need to focus our money on infrastructure. These things are wonderful in communities that have a lot of extra money that they don't know what to do with. But I will not support putting one nickel of the taxpayers' money into this. And I have a question perhaps Paulette can answer. I'd like to know how much we've spent so far uh, creating this beautiful model, and, and how much money have we spent so far into this study? And where did the money come from? We, we were authorized uh, $35,000, I believe it was two years ago. Uh, this model did not, as Miguel said, did not cost us anything. Miguel did this on his own time. It's the second trip here in his own time. That's how strong he feels about the bridge. You know, it, you, you have a very special site, and it's a very special location, and I'm so sure it's going to benefit you so much. Um, I have a lot of work all over the United States. I don't need this project to happen here. I mean, you know, I have very, very big bridges all over. But I think it's such a beautiful site, such a beautiful location. It will really change your whole area, and it will create so much um, enthusiasm to be here. And it's not only for tourists. It's for the people that are here in the city. I'm sure they will come to the river more. They will use the bridge as the destination. It's like a, something that will energize your whole, your whole area. And I, I just uh, believe that the opportunity is there, and I'm trying to you know, make it happen. Um, a model like this costs about $20,000. Um, you know, it opens and closes. It has a mechanical equipment. It's a very expensive model. But I thought it was a good investment for me to give you the model um, because uh, it will help you to imagine you know, what it can be in the future. And, um, and um, I hope it can do that. And I'm going to leave them all here you know, as, as long as you feel like the project has some possibility of being built. And, uh, and I feel very enthusiastic you know, about this uh, federal grant that is supposed to be given for non-motorized circulation of pedestrians and bicycles. And if you can get some money you know, through that, um, it's from the federal government, and it's supposed to benefit people that are walking and using bicycles, not cars. Because there is, you know, if you keep putting cars and cars and cars in the city, then you start to get more and more, more traffic, more and more pollution. So the federal government has some interest in doing, you know, something for pedestrians and bicycles. And this is one source that, you know, you could get. Thank you. Alderman Graf. Thank you. I was going to bring up the fact that the federal money that was out there, and, and looking at it that way, you know, I think this would be a great project to do for the city of Sheboygan. It would also, also connect the two areas and bring, 
unity to both the, um, the east side and the west side of the river, and um, it would create a district that people would want to go to and visit. And as far as, you know, looking at times where people are closing now, I think that has to be adjusted and will be adjusted once, once more activity is there. And you're looking at doing many things down at the riverfront that will encourage people to be there during the, the, the months of uh, February and March rather than closing it off and, and just leaving it like uh, they're, they're talking about a wine tasting and several uh, art displays and things like that that will bring people down to the South Pier area. So I think um, this would just add to it and it would be nice if, if the, the committee that's overseeing this $25 million would would know that the city of Sheboygan, yes, is interested and they are behind it. And I think we are overall interested in it and it is something that we'd like you to consider doing provided we get the funding that does not affect the taxpayers in any way. I, I think we support what you're saying and especially the point of uh, an endowment. I don't know how many projects I work on now that it's the endowment that's the critical thing, not the capital cost of, of building it because you want it to be something for your children or your grandchildren. Uh, I, I don't want to come across as argumentative, but to me that bridge is infrastructure. It's not frill. Uh, three and a half million dollars of three blocks of greening connecting Main Street and Racine down to the lake attracted a 500 employee building right on the corner of 5th and Main. 500 new employees in downtown Racine, okay? The other thing that it's going to attract, it's going to attract people so that you can develop residential here and you can develop more residential here. So it's an investment. How are you going to relocate or attract new businesses, innovative businesses in a community that was known for its innovation and its hard work ethic? How are you going to create jobs for the kids that are graduating today or tomorrow? It's this kind of an investment that is going to create the tax base to change that porta potty to a full-time uh, comfort station. One, just to follow, tonight was just a presentation on what's available. You're not looking for any vote of confidence or anything like that. What is your next step after this presentation? Is my last to, question. To wait, we'll make application to, to the county for that trail money. They don't have the process or procedures in place yet as soon as they do. That would be our first start. Thank you. And I would like to thank you for the model and for all the work you've done because if this becomes a reality, I think it's going to be because of this model. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the model is just extraordinary. But we still have lots of questions. So, <laughs> um, Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think my question is for Miguel here. But um, don't take my question wrong because it's a beautiful bridge and I think it would complement that area, as you say. But I, I do wonder, as you designed it, did you look at other design structures or de design types that would maybe influence the cost in um, our favor? Yes. I mean, I, I thought about doing a bascule structure, you know, like what the, the one you have. But I thought it would be much more complicated to raise 100 feet high, you know, in the air. Um, you need a lot of force to do that. So I kind of um, eliminated, you know, any bascule structures. Um, the swing bridge. You could have it without the cables, but then you will have to have a very thick structure and a very big motor, you know, to, to open it. And, and I thought, you know, the cables relate to the sailboats, and then why don't have the cables, and then it makes it lighter, and then you can operate better. So I also, you know, didn't think like just a, a, a common swing bridge, you know, could be possible here. Um, any other type of bridge that is not a swing or a bascule, it will require something that, you know, a leaf bridge, for example, that goes up and down. But your boats are so big, you need to go up so high. So I just think about <laughs> structures. But um, I felt like uh, you need to merge kind of the technical with the aesthetic together, trying to find something that, you know, will work well with your navigation channel, but also give you some kind of interest. Because, you know, if you take all the cables and the towers and you just leave it flat, you cannot see it from anywhere. It becomes very uh, utilitarian, and also I feel like it will cost you more because you'll have to have a very big load, you know, to carry to open it. Um, so it's a balance. It's a balance between, you know, technical issues and aesthetic issues. Um, but 
I have to tell you that if you come and see the model, it fits very well there. It's almost it was like, it was like it was planned to be there all along. Because the two cables here that, you know, frame the, the path here, they are very well organized. And you have another two cables here that frame, you know, in the other direction. So the whole circulation pattern is very well organized, you know, with the system. So it's almost like... It was planned especially for this location, and, and that's always very important because sometimes you take bridges, you know, the people make a bridge somewhere else and they want to put it just in another place. And uh, to me, that's like it fits the purpose because it doesn't really relate to the context, it's not integrated, and then people don't get something special for their community. And I always think, like, if you're going to make the investment and the effort to, you know, build it and maintain it, you should get something special. Otherwise, why, why bother? You know, you... you it becomes it becomes more a liability than an asset. So you need to have that. You need to have something that belongs to the area. Again, it is a beautiful bridge. Don't take me wrong. I mean, I'd love to see it down there. But I was just curious if there's other designs that would put the cost at $2 million, maybe others that would put it at 8 But I'm just trying to broaden my own scope of understanding what our options are so that when those yes. questions come to me, I can answer them. One, as probably all of you in the room know, one major constraint that we have in that river is PCB contamination. And that's what Miguel had to deal with with, you know, this design was how do you design a bridge without really impacting the surface of that river bottom, which then drove the cost up for that 8th Street Bridge. So that, that was a major constraint. That's what I was going to mention. Alvin Radke mentioned the cost on the 8th Street Bridge. The old bridge was only 25 horsepower. It was counterweighted. With the new bridge, we could not disturb the bottoms of PCBs, so it's not counterweighted, so it's 1,200 horsepower it's worth of electric motors down there. That's why it was so much to build, and that's why it costs so much to operate it every year. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's one of the reasons the, the main supports are in the land. There is nothing, nothing in the water. Like, if you go and see them all, the two towers are basically, you know, next to the land. Uh, yes. Thank you. Alman Ryan? Um, I would... Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Rosales on the on the model. It shows that you're you're serious about this project as a uh, as a uh, something that you would like to put your name on, rather than uh, throwing a bridge together to make some money. Um, I, I personally uh, uh, do endorse this this bridge. I think it'll be great for the community, providing we can find the funding. I think uh, this is this is economic infrastructure for our for our riverfront. Uh, I think this bridge will do a lot. Um, it would be nice to be able to walk across the river occasionally and get to the other side rather than driving around. And uh, provided that the money is available, that uh, the uh, uh, local taxpayers uh, don't take a big hit on it, I, I stand behind this project. Thank you. Thank you, Alman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, we sit here. Miguel, if you could move away from the map yes. there just a second. The picture I see there is the South Pier District. And I keep hearing from the people in this community, the South Pier District, Blue Harbor, here goes more money once again. What about 8th Street? What about downtown? What kind of an economic impact is it going to have to get people away from there and back up here to the main part of the city, which we seem to be lacking people and decent shops and things? I mean, this part of the town has been dying for years. And we tried to plaza. That didn't work. We need to start getting people back up here and used both of them. How is that going to happen by getting people back up here to 8th and Michigan, for example, or 8th and Ontario to the Stephanie Weil Center, 8th and Niagara? I mean, how is this going to help us, especially in the middle of winter? Uh, I think this, this trail money that we're talking about would be well spent putting a, a series of urban recreation trails using the railroad right-of-ways, if we could, something to get us bike paths through this community because... Frankly, the price of gas keeps going up, and more people are riding bicycles and taking alternative transportation. $5 million could get us a lot more for those people than what this bridge is going to provide us for the three months of the year because this is a summertime area down here, basically, getting across that river. We're not, Green, you know, we're not Greenville, South Carolina, where we have nice weather you know, uh, eight or nine months out of the year. We only have just a couple of months so that people are actually moving about. I can't support a five and a half or five million dollar bridge going across the river when there are other needs that this community needs to be taking a look at, like Eighth Street and bike trails and everything else. Thank you. I'd encourage you to go up to Duluth, and there's a uh, drawbridge down in the old industrial that goes to uh, a whole redeveloped area that's used 12 months out of the year. I think Duluth has a uh, uh, about. Uh, and they have to be creative how to deal with the winter. The other thing is uh, 
Uh, Miguel said it earlier, we've talked about throughout the whole process, it's not about just serving the out-of-town tourist. It's making this a 24-hour downtown place that, that attracts people to work and live. And a component of the South Pier, as well as the downtown, is about residential infill. It's not just all about retail. If you have the demand, you can provide the supply. That's where the retailers start coming. It's not just about the tourist. In terms of uh, helping the downtown, throughout this process, we met with the folks at the bid. We met with the Sheboygan Economic Development Corporation. We talked about this. There's a lot of candid discussion about how this could complement and enhance the downtown. And I, I think it was you who said, well, why do I need this when I can come down here 10 minutes and walk around? Well, imagine if you can walk 10 minutes between this and this instead of going down to the rotary and back up, the benefit it would have to the downtown. And it's very analogous to what they call a dumbbell scheme when they do regional shopping malls. You create two anchors and you generate traffic between. So if this becomes an anchor and this becomes an anchor, you start encouraging development between those two anchor uh, destinations. And tonight we're looking at the concept, and it could be years and years before we're looking at a vote of reality. Um, uh, President Berg. Thank you. Um, obviously, the, um, the shanty side of uh, our harbor area is, is fairly well built out. Uh, one of our long-range goals in terms of uh, the next stage of development is to upgrade and make Indiana Avenue a major corridor, uh, including hopefully a tie-in with I-43. Uh, I thought would be how does this impact on the development of that area? Because to me, that's probably the most fertile area for development. Uh, so if you have a bridge that crosses over that we are saying we are tying in to the downtown area, and we have already a significant interest in development on the Indiana Avenue corridor, which is, again, easily accessible when you walk around that way, and I think could be made very safe architecturally, architecturally, culturally, and economically a very attractive promenade to walk along because it parallels the river. Uh, how, how, how would that impact that? Uh, I guess any observations you might have because this truncates that. Well, there, there is a, a nice route down to Indiana now, down South Pier Drive through the, the rotary. You're down there. I don't think that the bridge here is going to work both ways of getting pedestrians from downtown to South Pier and from South Pier up to downtown, and some may trickle down to Indiana. I think it's going to be one, one loop, I believe. I, can't, I don't think how this bridge would negatively affect anybody on Indiana Avenue. And if I could comment too that this year one of the other projects that we're working on is extending the promenade onto this 8th and Indiana site and then making a pedestrian connection to Indiana. And so I think that that would enhance that. Okay, uh, Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is probably down the road a while, but I guess this would be a, to uh, a question for Tom or Paulette. Uh, is it possible to insure that bridge for any potential damage, like if there was a bad storm and one of those uh, commercial fishing boats or another boat would break loose? Obviously, they probably have insurance, but is there a way to protect our investment? Uh, anything, we're self-insured, and I believe the deductible is 75000 uh, So there, anything beyond that, if it's a lightning strike that takes something out, we had that happen down at Day Street Bridge, and it, uh, insurance, I believe, would cover that. I can't say that for sure. I have to check with Nancy and Rich. Okay. But I would certainly think that, like you said, too, if it's a boat that comes loose from its mooring and damages the bridge, their insurance would uh, be responsible for that Okay. if they had it. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we don't have any other questions. With that, I thank you for the presentation. And thank you for all your hard work. Tom? Do you want to see that model open, or yeah. it's, a, it's a working model? Can, can we see it? Could, could people come up? Or, well, can, will they be able to see it on TV? Do we know? Yeah. yeah, if you would like to do it once for the TV, the man behind the wall said, yeah. So if you could just do it once, and then we'll come around and look at it later. Okay. Alderman Graf? Um, where, where, after this presentation, is that model going to be located so that in case somebody wants to come down and see it in operation, because um, you might have a lot of people doing that. 
It's in the conference room in Paulette's office at 807 Center Avenue. <laughs> but then Tom's the only one that's authorized to open the bridge. So. <laughs> <laughs> we got to certify. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no, what happened is like, you see, it has to open in phases. You cannot open the two of them together. You have to open one first and then the other one. Because if you open together, they will hit each other. Because it's kind of like a half moon. So when you see it in the mall, it has to be in order. You cannot just open it any other way. So that's why Tom is in charge. Um, but it has numbers here. So you follow the numbers, you should be able to uh, you know, figure it out. So I'll open the first leaf. Please stand up. And then the second leaf. And you see how the cables are, are stable in the, the back ca cables stay in place. And it has a, like a triangular shape, so it's very, very stable. Um, so, you know, this is the, the way it's, it's open. You have the whole navigation channel open. And then you have to close it again in order. So when it was open, you were seeing 150 feet clear. And the whole, the whole mechanism is here at the top. And now the other leaf. You got the other leaf. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Unfortunately, we already have a technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I think we can, I mean, if you want to see it, we can see it again afterwards. All right, afterwards we'll look at it again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have communication number 390607 from Richard Hartman regarding accepted procedures for all members of committees when they present letters, documents on an issue before the committee. On your desk, I have a, a copy of an e email that President Berg asked me to put on your desk that he had a conversation through email with Richard Hartman. Um, can I have a motion on the document before discussion? Second. Motion and second to file under discussion. Uh, under discussion, I talked to Richard Hartman on the phone, and he felt it wasn't necessary to... to uh, talk any more about the letters here at, at a committee of the whole meeting, but he just wanted us to be aware of, of both the, uh, the communications. All in favor of filing it, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next on the agenda is RO number 1360607 from the city clerk submitting a communication from Richard Hartman stating his issues with the uses of space in the new police station and offering suggestions to reduce space needs. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move that that RO be referred to the Building Use Committee and also to the Police Department because many of the questions that Mr. Hartman is asking for and uh, regarding uh, his list of um, items is something that the police need to answer. And since they will be answering many of the our uh, requests, our um, concerns that were brought up at the Building Use Committee about a month ago. Um, on Monday, the 31st, uh, this, I think, should be referred to them also so that they can address those concerns. Thank second. you. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. And is there any discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Motion Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. We are adjourned.